Hi, this is a short video to assist volunteer Wales administrators uh, with some of the key issues which were raised during our Swansea meeting um, a short while ago. So what we're doing, I'm just going to quickly um, take you through some of the, the key points and tell you about what we're doing about those points, what kind of solutions um, we've got planned, or um, obviously kind of explain them in a bit more detail so you understand them a um, little bit better. Um, so we'll move on to the first point. Okay, the first thing we're going to go through is joining and applying opportunities. Um, now, I'm aware that this has been uh, an issue with a number of our users. Um, we are due to do a big overhaul of this function um, within the next couple of updates. Um, but until then, if I show you, explain how it works, hopefully it will help you uh, kind of navigate your way through creating these types of opportunities. So, uh, whether you're a provider or an administrator, you go to create opportunity and you fill in all the details and there's an option down here that says joining or applying. Now joining is essentially first come first serve. Um, so most of your opportunities should be joining. The only applying opportunities you should have is if there is an application process, there is a shortlisting process and there is a definite start where all volunteers start at the same time. Um, like a job, for example, with a job, people apply um, and then there's a definite start. You do a shortlisting process, then there is a definite start date. Um, so that is when you can use applying. Now, if you even if there's an application process, but there is no definite start date, i.e. it's kind of ongoing. So say it goes on for 12 months, something like that, and you're going to have people kind of joining and leaving that opportunity um, throughout the 12, that 12 months then that cannot be an applying opportunity because there is not a definitive start point for all volunteers who have joined it. They're going to be starting as, a, you know, as and when um, they see the opportunity over the 12 month period. So that's why most of your opportunities will have to be joining. Now, if you do set it to applying, um, what happens <laughs> is once you set it to applying, it does change your communication and it says, thank you for applying. You'll be informed at a later date if you are successful. Um, and when you go to the opportunity, you find an opportunity on here. So imagine you've, you've created the opportunity, you've set it as applying, um, say 10 volunteers have joined that opportunity, um, and now you've got to do the shortlisting process. Okay, so let me find an opportunity with some volunteers on it. Hopefully there's one here with a few volunteers. No, there's not. There's one here with one volunteer. I can show you with one volunteer. So if click on the manage button. Click on the volunteers. This is where you'd be doing your shortlist and process. So at this stage here, you'd be either clicking on the volunteer's name to see their information. Um, uh, you'd be able to obviously see any details, whether they require um, accessibility support, for, ex uh, for example. And once you're happy with that particular volunteer being on the opportunity, you would click on that tick button there. That's basically just a note to yourself to, to, to make yourself aware that, OK, this person has applied and I'm happy for them to make the shortlist. Now, once you've gone through, if you decided the volunteer, sorry, was not suitable for the opportunity, then you click on the remove from the opportunity button and that would send them an email informing them that they've been removed. So what you're going to end up with is either volunteers, um, a load of volunteers which have ticks on them. Because all the ones that don't have ticks would have been removed from the opportunity and would have been informed automatically via email by clicking that button there. So once you've got a list of all the volunteers who are on the opportunity and you're happy that they should stay on there, they are successful, that's when you'd um, you'd click on the confirm. There's a big confirm button that appears up here. You click on the confirm opportunity button and that then um, sends an email to those remaining volunteers saying uh, congratulations you are on this opportunity. But obviously that doesn't work if you've got this kind of rolling on and rolling off, um, you know, uh, with volunteers rolling on and rolling off the same opportunity because they haven't they haven't got you haven't got that specific date um, so that's why you would always in that instance you would always choose um, joining and create it as a joining opportunity now keep in mind if you do cr create it uh, as a joining opportunity then the communication they're going to get is going to say kind of congratulations you know we'll, we'll see you on the day so make sure in the description that you make it quite clear that there is a shortlisting aspect to this opportunity okay um, so hopefully that's a bit clearer
Okay, so in order to edit uh, an existing opportunity that you've created, go down to your opportunities. This is logged in as provider, by the way, in this particular example. Um, but you'll have the same kind of option. I think it says opportunities or your opportunities on the admin side as well. Um, and list the opportunities here. Find the opportunity you want to edit. Click on manage. Okay, then down here, we've got this side menu here. Now, if we go down to details, that will show us all the details that we entered in when we created the opportunity. So you can change your, you know, the title or the description, um, whether it's joining or applying, etc. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the things you people are querying is the ability to copy an opportunity. So there's a number of reasons you might want to copy an opportunity. Um, if you have a number of opportunities which are identical in description, um, but they are at different locations, so for example, you might have an opportunity to help out in the library, but it might be five libraries spread across the city, um, then they are different opportunities because they're all at different locations, although the skills and the kind of deep the description stuff are identical. So you would probably create one, the first opportunity, and then you'd copy it, and once you've copied it, you'd just be changing the location over. Then you copy it again and change the location until you've done that to cover the five different locations. Um, it may be the opposite way around. It may be that um, actually when they're taking place is exactly the same. So, so maybe it's on an event or something like that. You said, well, I've got five opportunities here. Uh, they're all doing different things, but it's all in the same event taking place at the same time. I need them here at the same time. Um, so you might create the first opportunity, then copy. <laughs> and then on the second opportunity, you just change it over the description and kind of the skills that are required, etc. Um, so to copy an opportunity, We've got one here which is called flexible op with an area location it's just on the demo site so the name of it's flexible op with an area location so if i go down here on the side menu i've got convert and copy so click on that there it says i can either convert it which i'm not interested but i want to copy it so copy opportunity once i click copy it, at that point it creates a copy of the opportunity as you would um, as you'd expect now what I'd imagine might be confusing some people is this time shifting thing. So this time shifting thing, this is about, um, it lets you basically say, okay, I'll have a, I, 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 we've copied this opportunity, but do you want to change the, all the sessions um, to kind of forward in time? So say if I had an opportunity um, which were, took place one year ago, and I'd say, oh, you know what, it's exactly the same opportunity, it's for just for the, for the same event just a year later. Then rather than having to change over the dates of all those sessions, I could just go in here, and choose to time shift it by one year and that would create it exactly 365 days ahead and all the sessions would be exactly 365 days ahead so that's about time shifting but you may not need to time shift if you don't then just ignore it okay if you just want it if you're just changing over like for example the locations like the library first example I gave with the libraries then you don't need to time shift it um, so you go down here and we've got an exact copy now if I go back to the opportunities, you'll see we have, actually, let me change the name of this one. So this is, we've now got two opportunities called flexible op with an area location. So if I go to details and call that copy there, and save it, when I go back to the opportunities, you will see it in there. Your opportunities, flexible op with area location, flexible op with area location copy. As you can see, all the dates are exactly the same. Everything's identical apart from the name at the moment. Okay. Um, now, if I wanted to change the location, then obviously before I saved it, I just I'd be I would have created the copy and I would have gone down to location and I would have clicked on change. Just have location here. Click on change and I would change the location of it. Okay. I hope that's useful. As for changing the type of opportunity. So like I said, you might want to change a location or you might want to change an opportunity so it's no longer a um, flexible opportunity. Um, it's a session based opportunity instead, which means you know exactly when and for how long it's going to be taking place. And it, you know, Rather than taking place over a three month period, it's just, um, OK, it's every Tuesday night, seven o'clock for two hours, for example. In which case, you go down to the same option down here and you say convert and copy but this time. We're not interested in the copy function, we're interested in the convert. So this one is a, um, a flexible opportunity as it stands. 
So it's one long session, essentially, is the way the system looks at it. We're going to convert it into a regular opportunity. So click on Convert to Regular, and now that's done. So when I go down to the sessions, I have that one session there. It starts at 9 o'clock, but I can now go and add additional sessions in there. So okay, I'm going to put the session in there. Now we've got two sessions in there. So that's changing from a flexible to a, a session based, which is like your repeating or non-repeating opportunities. Just to just to reinforce, if you know exactly when and for how long the opportunity is going to take place, then it's a session based opportunity. So it's it's um, you know either repeating or non-repeating. So when you go to create the opportunity at the bottom, you've got this repeating and non-repeating. So if it's if you know when and for how long it's repeating or non-repeating. If you do not know that and you're going to discuss it directly with a volunteer and kind of work it around their lectures or, or you know, you're going to discuss it around their timetable, um, then it's a flexible opportunity. Okay, so when we talk about converting, we're converting from a flexible to a session based, which is repeating and non-repeating or vice versa. Okay, I hope that's useful. Okay, the next one is adding existing volunteers. Um, now, you can't kind of, no option here for you to kind of add and enter in the details of the volunteer for, for quite obvious reasons, I suppose. If you did, then they, you wouldn't know what their passwords are and they'd need passwords to log in to be able to join, you know, to log in and see what, see what opportunities they're on and, and join other opportunities. So, um, so we, uh, we can't allow you to kind of add volunteers, although they can, um, what you can do is send them to a page where if they register on your provider profile page then they're automatically linked to you so you can see their information and you can add them to your opportunities um, for example so if you go to account details your public profile you've most of you are probably aware of this you've got the ability here to kind of create your um, provider profile page it's like a mini web page which sits within um, the volunteer system um, that's the web address of the mini web page. If you send anybody to that web page, they would see, um, click on here, they would see this page here. Okay. Now it shows just your opportunities and information regarded to, um, related to, your, um, to you as a provider. Um, I've also got registered to access these opportunities. If they click on this button here, then it will automatically link, you, uh, link the volunteer tier through to yourself as a provider which means that when you go when you're on here and you go to manage volunteers your linked volunteers you'll be able to see them there even your volunteers will do it you'll be able to see them there in the list and from here you can communicate with them or drop them emails or whatever else you want, want to be able to do with them. Um, I hope that's useful okay next one is emails um, messaging so we do capture obviously if you want to email volunteers you normally go down to your volunteers page and click on your search for your volunteers and it will show you all volunteers that have been linked to you or kind of have been ever been on any of your opportunities and from here you can select them and you can uh, go down to email selected volunteers you can email them that way um, there's no problem in doing that um, that works perfectly fine now if you want to see, I think the question is about the, being able to see what emails have been sent um, and what emails have been received. Uh, now, if you go to account details, down to email log. Okay, we've got an, on the left hand side, we've got inbox and sent. Um, so this will show you all information of kind of communications that have, um, that have been received by you as a provider and information or communications that have been sent. Uh, now there are going to be some holes in this because obviously if you imagine if you send out an email from the system uh, so you go to an opportunity and you send an email out saying um, remember to bring your, your, your raincoats tomorrow then that email will go out and it'll be sent out directly to to um, to that to those volunteers uh, but if those volunteers reply and they reply they reply just to your personal email address so not replying to the system replying to your personal email address um, then obviously you will not the system doesn't know that that's happened it's a direct communication between the volunteer and volunteers email account and your email account it's kind of uh, bypassed the system okay 
We've had a couple of questions come up uh, in regards to provider contacts and one of them is asking why um, we only allow one email address uh, per provider. Um, I mean the main key reason is obviously they're logging in. So when you log in um, as opportunity provider it asks for an email address and password. Now the email address will obviously go through to a particular account so if you've got more than one account then you'd have to suddenly accept multiple email addresses to, put, to send you through to the same actual log you in as the same provider which is going to create an issue but then the key issue really for me is the communications so if you have multiple accounts and then a volunteer joins an opportunity so if you sorry if you have multiple email addresses linked to the same provider account and the volunteer joins that opportunity then there's no way of knowing who's responded to that volunteer. So one provider might respond to them and email them and, and, and say, you know, thanks, you know, see you on the Monday morning. Then the other providers have no idea that that first provider's actually contacted them. They aren't separate. They are separate providers. They're all doing separate jobs. Now, quite often we find we'll have a provider which will be the name of the organisation, but they have uh, maybe three people who are creating opportunities. Well, there, pro there probably is um, some kind of definition in place that, which dictates what opportunities those three people create. Okay, so whether it's geographical, whether it's kind of you know north, south, you know um, central or something like that, or whether it's um, to do with the types of opportunities that are being created, there is still is some kind of you know there's some kind of um, logic behind who creates and who manages those opportunities in which case then they should be set up as three separate providers with you know um, with with slightly different names so it could be kind of a um, my organization dash north my organization dash south my organization dash central but they are three separate providers who are creating their own distinct vol um, volunteer opportunities um, so hopefully that clears up why why we set it up in that particular way Another question which uh, seems to quite frequently come up is why do volunteers need an email address um, and why do they need to register before joining up? So it's two separate questions. The first, an answer to the first question, why do they need an email address? Because they need an email to log in and obviously to receive any communications. Now as you'll probably, you may well be aware, um, within the latest update we've allowed administrators to be able to um, add volunteers themselves without an email address so let me just show you now um, if I log in as an, an, I can say an administrator on the demo system and you've got an option right at the top under volunteer management you've got create volunteer and this will it does ask for an email address and password but as you can see they're not red boxes they're gray which means that they're not mandatory so we can just skip past them if we want just completely ignore them put nothing in at all and go to the next button now they're down that's fine it'll register them as a volunteer and we can capture the kind of basic information um, and they can even join opportunities where you can join it on their behalf if, if you know what I mean um, but obviously they won't be able to receive any communications via email because we haven't registered their email address on the system uh, now this is flagged up to people who are running the opportunities to let them know that they need to phone this person and there's no point emailing them because they won't receive it. So people who are running the opportunities are aware that this volunteer does not have an email address. Um, now obviously that's, you know, the best case scenario is they do have an email address. The reason being is that they can log in and they can manage their opportunities and they can receive communications without everybody having to, the providers having to phone around. Um, so that's why we ask for email addresses. But as you can see, as I've just showed you, there's a way to do it without email addresses um, for some of the um, uh, Alder volunteers. Uh, secondly, you've said need to register before joining opportunities. Um, yeah, they need to, obviously, to, in order to join an opportunity, we need to capture their basic information. And we need to, you know, things like their emergency contact details, um, even to you know the, the date of birth um, and the location we use this information you see to obviously show them the correct search results so if they don't register um, then we've no way of knowing how old they are the person could be 10 years old and we have no idea so until they register that's when we know the basic information about them so we can decide whether they are eligible to get on particular opportunities so we do need I mean we do need every volunteer to be um, to be registered on the system before they join any opportunity um, I hope that clears up.